Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association, connecting alumni to the university and to each other. The Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. And from viewers like you, thank you. Hi, I'm Robert Johnson. Invasive species are a problem in many states, including Pennsylvania. They can be damaging to ecosystems and even endanger native species. But what exactly is an invasive species and how are they introduced into an ecosystem? And once they are, what can be done about them? On this episode of Digging Deeper, Penn State President Eric Barron talks to Eric Burkhart, Instructor and Plant Science Program Director at Shavers Creek Environmental Center, and Art Gover, Research Support Associate in the Department of Plant Science, about invasive species. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. Fascinating topic. Maybe we could start with just what exactly is an invasive species? What makes it invasive? It's a label to describe an exotic species that has moved somewhere else and then is impacting the ecosystem, human health issues, uh, certainly causing economic issues as well. But I, I think I, I would want to emphasize it's an exotic species. It's exotic not exotic meaning it, it wouldn't normally live there. Exactly. It evolved somewhere else with a whole different cohort of species and has come here and has now disrupted an ecosystem. So maybe it would be worthwhile to sit there and think about how did it get here? Because I could imagine, and maybe I'm completely wrong, here comes a bird transiting an area as it migrates and it drops seeds somehow. Mm -hmm. And is that an invasive? Yeah, that's, that's actually a great question. So uh, we have a number of different categories of invasive species, right? We have invasive plants, we have invasive insects, invasive pathogens, and depending on the invasive species, uh, there's different ways that it's been introduced. So we often think about insects and pathogens as kind of being hitchhikers. They come here unintentionally. Most of our invasive plants are actually introduced because they have ornamental value or some other type of value, like they create some food source for uh, wildlife. Uh, the problem is, is that they have unintentional consequences in many cases uh -huh. and spread from beyond, say, a person's yard into natural areas. And so, you know, the, the definition really of an invasive species as opposed to just a weed is that they don't necessarily just follow disturbance, but they actually will migrate into existing ecosystems via wind, water, or in some cases via birds, for example. So I can have all of these categories from something like the bird, and something accidental, something unintentional that someone decides is beautiful they're gonna put in their yard. Mm -hmm. If it's not something that's opportunistic and doesn't just go like this, do we still call it an invasive? Or is invasive telling us that this this plant or insect is literally invading? You'll find that um, a lot of plants end up with the invasive label, but they kind of range in their ability to come in and, and take advantage of opportunity. For, so some of them are definitely opportunistic and mm -hmm. require some other disturbance mm -hmm. to get started. Yeah. Whereas others on the spectrum, it's you just introduce them and and they go. And they go. So, so sometimes, if I'm listening to you correctly, sometimes you view these as dangerous. What would make one dangerous? Well, I think that there's a lot of different impacts, of course, of invasive plants in particular. Uh, some, in the terms of the danger that they present, have uh, compounds or chemicals, secondary metabolites that are actually deemed hazardous to human health. So a great example of that, that the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has been working for about the last 10 years to eradicate before it gets a toehold in Pennsylvania is giant hogweed, mm -hmm. which has a sap that actually can create uh, severe irritation, even scarring um, in, on the skin. And so, uh -huh. uh, you know, we talk about danger, there are those direct impacts of some of these species. 
Um, some have more of an indirect danger, so there's a, a body of research that's looking at the potential for many of the invasive shrubs, like barberry and honeysuckle, to host uh, Lyme disease-carrying mm. ticks, mm. much more preferentially than native shrubs would, for example, mm. because of the architecture and the microclimate created by these shrubs. Uh, so that's more of an indirect kind of impact. And then we have uh, impacts that are not really a danger, but uh, represent kind of a shift in what we value for the ecosystems as a society. So the recreational value, for example, of an area, the ability to, to freely hike through the understory of a forest without getting into a tangle of uh, spines and barbs and things. Barbs that are and things get like that. Yeah. So it really is the whole... The whole the spectrum, whole, yeah. Yeah, but in almost every case, or maybe in every case, there is a perceived negative. Of the invasive species? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and, and uh, I think the very definition of an invasive plant in particular, um, people perceive as there being some sort of negative consequence. Yeah. That being said, many invasive plants have been and to some degree are still introduced because they do have some sort of positive value. Yeah. Uh, and so you have to weigh those types of things. And, and that's something that we're really, you know, I, I think of invasive species and invasive plants in particular as very similar to climate change. It's kind of an emerging consciousness that we as a society are, are kind of wrapping our brains around. Yeah. That these there's pros and cons to introducing these exotic species into our landscape. Mm -hmm. And we have to start weighing these things before we start, before we bring in the next best ornamental from China, for mm -hmm. example. I mean, so, sorry, yeah. but a phenomenon that Eric and I have to deal with in our work is what we call plant blindness. Uh -huh. We're just getting people to understand that it really does matter what what's they around plant. you. Just because yeah. it's green and verdant mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's a positive setting. So uh, because so many of the effects are long-term in nature, um, you know, just the effect, for instance, on migratory songbirds mm -hmm. as communities shift from native to exotic and invasive, just the amount of food resource available to them Changes. through caterpillar yeah. is drastically reduced. So, so this is, this is a, a, an, another category of impact then. So you have the plant, the sap, it can scar your, your skin. This is not a very positive thing. You have another case, a, a tree or a species for which ticks are much more successful. That's not a particularly appealing thing. But what you've just described is unbalancing an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, are there some good examples that, that people would relate to where something was introduced and it truly unbalanced the ecosystem? Mm. I think Eric has named several. Uh, a lot of the shrubs with ornamental heritage or introduced to enhance wildlife actually did the opposite. So you look at Japanese barberry, you look at autumn olive, multiflora rose, um, things like the, the privet species. Hmm. You find out they come into these wild settings, if you will, they displace the native shrubs. Structurally, they look very similar. Mm -hmm. But in terms of food resources, they're very for different. Other, right, for other aspects of the food web, all of a sudden you've created um, a Cascades fairly- Cascades through the birds and everything else. Exactly. And there's, yeah. there's a often unseen component. You know, we, we think about ecosystems as being food webs, right? And having all these interconnected pieces. And uh, one of the things that we're starting to wrap our brains around is the fact that some of these invasive plants in particular, once they are established, they grow in an area for a while, they may release a chemistry, for example, we call the term allelopathic. So they may put uh, secondary metabolites into the soil as the foliage is decomposed. It stops and, other things. And it can create uh, imbalances in ways that, you know, the naked eye can't reveal. So yeah. for example, uh, one of the species that has been introduced, an herbaceous plant, garlic mustard, was introduced in the late 1800s as a food source. It's in the mustard family. It's related to kale, for example. Uh, it's highly nutritional. But the problem with it is, as we're starting to figure out how it invades and why it changes these ecosystems, is it has these uh, compounds known as glucosinolates that are leached into the soil, and they don't necessarily directly impact many plants, many native species directly, but they actually kill off the symbiotic fungi, the mycorrhizal partners that a lot of the trees, as they germinate and grow towards the canopy, need to survive. And so a lot of these impacts in terms of uh, 
unbalancing the ecosystem oftentimes are unseen. Hmm. And uh, many people don't recognize don't realize the consequences what, yeah. of it. Fascinating. And it's more than just plant. What are the notable examples of other in insects, for example? Well, certainly the, the new exciting insect, if you will, is the spotted lanternfly, mm -hmm. which currently is limited to a, a 14 county quarantine in the state, but tremendous effort here with the extension service, with federal partners, state partners, to try to limit that spread. You had the emerald ash borer, which, you know, in our locality has pretty much done what it's going to do, and it's been fairly devastating. Mm -hmm. So I mean, those are probably two most recent examples. Mm -hmm. our, our state tree, the eastern hemlock, is affected by the woolly adelgid, which was introduced accidentally, probably on plant stock from the Orient and uh, it is slowly killing populations of our state tree uh, to the effect that, you know, in many areas, it's obviously a very important ecological species in many areas Beautiful as well. Too. And yeah. many state parks feature it in the ecosystems. And so there's a real issue with, we know we could kill this insect, so to speak, using a combination of tactics, but from an economic standpoint, it's just not possible to manage thousands of acres you yeah. know, using many of these tactics. Yeah, so, you know, this is, this is the Elm story all over again, but different, yeah. Yeah. And then you, you end up with a much fewer varieties too, which must. Right. So, so how, how is it that we, how is it that we deal with this? I mean, so I sit there and go spotted lantern fly, I see what it looks like, I'm like, I'm going to, look around and see if I see anything. I, I doubt I'm smart enough unless it's by accident or something like that. So what you just suggested, we could take action, very expensive, difficult to do, isolated trees all over the place. So what, what are the mechanisms by which people can? Yeah. Well, a lot of it's mental readjustment. Um, you know, you start losing important species like the American chestnut, you know, yeah. you had the chestnut blight. So a little bit of it is you're just constantly readjusting your expectations. Mm -hmm. But I think certainly if people just work on the scale of their own yard. I think yeah. if you look at the work of Doug Tallamy at the University of Delaware, he's done a tremendous job of establishing that linkage between charismatic species like migratory songbirds and the insects that they feed on and mm -hmm. the absolute it's essential nature of having native plants in your own landscape. So I think, mm -hmm. I think ultimately, if we just manage our own space, it'll have a much larger effect. Mm -hmm. What Art's alluding to uh, is, you know, from a broader standpoint, what we often talk about, whether it's in extension programs to the public or in, in courses that we teach is, is that we've really got four tools or tactics at our disposal. We've got what Art just mentioned, cultural, first and foremost. We've got to be aware of these things, particularly if they're known invasive species or have invasive tendencies and avoid putting them in our yards. Um, but we also then can start thinking about other ways that if they're present, so many people own forest lands in the state of Pennsylvania, Let's, let's say that these things are already moving in. You've established that they're coming from my yard or my neighbor's yard, and I've managed to get rid of them in the yard. Um, then we move up the chain to, okay, well, how are we going to get rid of these things, right? And so we have three more tactics at our disposal. One is called mechanical. So we get in there and see if we can pull this thing out or cut it back or that sort of thing. The next one up the chain is biological. A little bit controversial, but there's a lot of work that goes on in Pennsylvania and elsewhere looking at biological warfare, if you will, things that can be used to kind of shift that balance back in a positive direction. Here at the university, there's been a lot of work, for example, with a pathogen known as Ilanthus wilt to control tree of heaven. Uh, and then the final tactic, which is unfortunately what a lot of people think of when we talk about controlling invasive species is go straight for some sort of herbicide. Herbicides are a tool in the toolkit, but certainly we need to be prudent about where and how we're applying these things, right? And so we have this whole suite of kinds of approaches that we can look at, but the first and foremost is awareness and the cultural decisions we make in our own properties. Yeah, that sounds to me that it's, it is really important. I'm, <coughs> I'm trying to imagine how many people in looking at their own yards and they're thinking of the landscape and wanting 
to plant things and have it be beautiful, would they, would they even know or have a level of awareness? So, you know, I go to a nursery, not doing any of it now, and I go say, well, that's beautiful, that's beautiful, and I, and I, I buy it, but does a nursery today label this is an invasive or no. this, you know, please be careful here or? Incrementally, we're making progress on that. Yeah. Front. You'll see some states go to the point of regulating that. I think Pennsylvania, we're still more, if you will, market driven in trying to solve that. But, you know, absolutely. And, and I think what ties into that, too, is just we really need to change our perception of what a beautiful landscape looks like. Because mm -hmm. most of these exotics, if you follow their horticultural roots, go back to pest free which in and of itself is the problem. What we really need are people to be able to go out into their landscape and see that, oh cool, I've got a native caterpillar munching on the leaves of my plant. Because uh -huh. one of the things, and you had stressed it before, was this idea of balance, of yeah. balanced landscape. You're gonna see that your plants are in fact food for other things. Right. If nothing's eating your plants, your plants aren't food, and if your plants aren't food, the whole ecosystem Isn't. around your yard is is collapsing. Yeah, fascinating. So it's, it's, yeah, it's an interesting twist. Uh, and I'm just digging twist. up some, I will tell you what my philosophy of gardening now is. I don't want any grass. Right. I would just like to have it be <laughs> woods. Right. Well, and it, it's, you know, we, we are seeing, as I mentioned earlier, there is a, a changing kind of awareness yeah. about uh, this issue and invasive species particularly around invasive uh, plants that Juan puts in their garden. Uh, so I work closely with the Master Gardener program, for mm -hmm. example, and we've seen exponential interest by master gardeners and the people that they interact with in Pennsylvania in this idea of native species in the garden, mm -hmm. pollinator gardens, uh, what is often referred to these days as ecological gardening. So as mm -hmm. Art referred to, putting in a native plant like a, a spice bush to support a spice bush swallowtail population, right? Uh -huh. And so recognizing that just because something is eating that plant doesn't necessarily mean that we run and get an insecticide and start spraying it, but yeah. we understand a little bit more about what that insect is mm -hmm. and uh, maybe work with that, that population. And, you know, of course, one of our most charismatic and, and well-known insects that we're trying to do that with is the monarch butterfly. Yeah. Uh, with people, you know, obviously interested in milkweed plantings on their property more and more each and every year. So... Am I safe if I'm looking at plants and they go, this is great for butterflies, butterfly bush or something, this is great for so and this is great for songbirds? Not necessarily. Not the necessarily. Butterfly, so I the could butterfly go the wrong bush way. is that classic example yeah. of it's a great nectar source. Yeah. Uh, but for instance, if you look at the monarch, the monarch can't use a butterfly bush as a place to lay its eggs. So I mean, you need native plants and actually specifically milkweeds, but that's, it's kind of, easy to be drawn into being a little bit of a benefit, but overall being detrimental. And really, butterfly bush is like number one poster child for that. Really? See, this worries me because I, I'm looking at the advertising mm -hmm. in a sense. You know, this is good for songbirds. This is good for, oh, I'll, I, I will go do that. So, right. Well, if it's good for songbirds, I think what you're going to find is it's actually a plant that's hosting a lot of caterpillars. Mm -hmm. where it's kind of easy to get pulled off is it attracts butterflies because there's a lot of invasives that attract butterflies because they're a great nectar source, uh -huh, but they don't provide anything else. Yeah. So they have a very limited function in the ecosystem. So let's, let's take this one that's in the news with the, the lantern fly. Do, is there hope to actually eradicate it? Is it too late? Does a quarantine, if someone is sitting there and they go, you know, uh, oh, Aunt Mildred loved that plant, I'll give her a cutting, it, and transports it out of the county. It, is, it, is it too late once well, it's Well, viscerally, once you've done this long enough, you realize eradication is an idea, it's not a practice. Right. So, I mean, I think if you look at the current footprint of the lanternfly and the footprint of its preferred host, which is Tree of Heaven or Alanthus, I mean, I think we're looking at slowing its spread and developing the management practices we need to protect the other economically valuable plants that it's going to try to host mm -hmm. on. But I don't see us, we might slow it, but I don't see us yeah. limiting its footprint. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, on that note, you know, insects and pathogens are, are much more difficult to manage than plants, right? So I mentioned giant hogweed earlier. Yeah. We've been fairly successful in the state. I mean, it's not entirely eradicated, but when new populations uh, pop up, the PDA has done a very good job of educating the public about, you know, be aware of this giant Pennsylvania hogweed. Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Right. Yeah. And so uh, you've got a lot of public buy-in, particularly because this thing is so dangerous through its sap, uh -huh. and children coming into contact in particular with its sap, to raising the awareness to PDA that, you know, that, that this thing is here, or it's potentially here. And so they've done a very good job of managing and controlling that, and plants in that regard are a lot, they're fixed, so they're a lot yeah. easier to kind of control the spread of if we are aware at the outset that there's yeah. a problem here. Yeah. So, you know, just fascinating topic and seems like a, a, a challenge. And, you know, just as a last question, uh, what do you think the landscape of Pennsylvania is going to look like in 10 years? I think you're going to have islands mm -hmm. where we're devoting our efforts because we definitely do our work on very finite footprints with very finite resources. So mm -hmm. you're going to see areas that we have preserved yeah. that diversity, but the areas that aren't getting the attention, you're going to see that onward uh, development of invasive species and drastic change. And yep. Yeah, and I would just add to that that I think that that you know the positive message is, as we've been talking about, that people can do a lot on their own in their own landscape, yes, um, and and it it need not involve 40 acres of forest land. It could be your little postage stamp parcel in the middle of suburbia. And if you're educated, that makes a big difference. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Fascinating topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Barron, thank you so much for joining My me pleasure. today. Yes, yes, definitely. So recently you shared a progress report on Greek life and also Penn State released an initial report that focused on hazing violations. That report has since been published per the Timothy J. Piazza anti-hazing law. So as you look back on Greek life over the past few years and where it is today, where would you like to see Greek life moving forward? What's your vision? Well, so the objective all along was strengthen the good and minimize uh, behaviors that, that were, were unsafe. And so we instituted these reforms, and I would say we're in this mode where we're assessing how well they're working and, and, and perhaps uh, adjusting them some because of it. So we're immediately encouraged by the fact that in the first full year of the implementation of reforms, you know, the crime rate in the borough dropped 20 percent, the crime rate associated with Greek life dropped 30 percent, the, the number of sexual assaults dropped, the, the number of people going to Mount Nittany Medical Center with alcohol emergencies dropped like 90 students in just the fall semester. So, and the grade point of all Greek life organizations went up. Okay, so this, so we feel like this is a positive element. And at the same time, we're pretty tough. If there's hazing, the, the, the Piazza anti-hazing law report shows Penn State's very serious. If there's a problem and there's hazing and, and alcohol problems, we're going to suspend uh, the, the fraternity or sorority and, and for many years in a lot of cases. So I am cautiously optimistic that we're going to watch kind of a new culture emerge. Um, more academic, more leadership, more networking, less negative behavior. And as we saw in a previous episode, it seems like students are speaking up and speaking out even more in some of these dangerous cases they too. They are. We're, we're seeing it. We're seeing uh, a lot of students stepping up to leadership roles and, uh, and nationally people are watching what we're doing and that also helps a lot because um, this means every institution gets the benefit of of what works. And students not only speaking out about Greek life, but also about university life here on this campus. And Penn State recently launched the Advocate Penn State Initiative. It's a new effort that seeks to encourage Penn Staters to make their voice heard to a legislative body, such as elected officials. So what would you like to see happen with this initiative, say, just a year from now? How would you like to see this progress? So I think one simple way to think about it is look at this tremendous number of alumni that we have and many of them going well I don't like that or I, I see why that impact might occur mm 
mm. that's negative, how do I do it? How do I weigh in? And another thing that's been very impactful since you got here to Penn State, one of your main focuses has been on diversity and inclusion. We see it in the emails, we see it yep. in your blog, we've seen it throughout different messages that you've sent to not only this campus, but also to the other Commonwealth campuses in the mm -hmm. state of Pennsylvania. So what changes have been made in the past few years that include diversity and inclusion with students and also with faculty? So what has happened in the past and where would you like to see that progress as you move forward? You know, interestingly, there are dozens of things that have happened. A whole set of volunteers that will help on searches, um, hiring someone whose who's focus is on recruitment strategies and retention strategies, um, different attitude about a lot of different searches, uh, everything from banners in the community that say you're welcome here. So there's a lot of different things. But what is really concerning is that all through our history of doing things, the growth in diversity is very, very slow. And you don't see some place where big changes have occurred. So this is not an easy problem to, to solve, but it's very important. It's very important for the richness of the community. It's very important for, frankly, the economics of our community, and it's a moral imperative. So we're gonna keep working at it, but. We're, we're far from satisfied. And making progress. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Thank you. Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association. Connecting alumni to the university and to each other, the Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. And from viewers like you. Thank you.